right. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy October 31st, 2022. Hope everyone's having a good one. This is my unofficial Halloween video. I'm going to start with some Beavis and Butthead covers that remind me of the holiday. Although the entire classic Marvel run kind of reminded me of Halloween. Just because <laughs> Beavis and Butthead are a couple of psychopaths, basically. <laughs> this one right here. They're trick-or-treating at Tom Anderson's store, but the joke is on them because it is November 1st. This isn't an according to Hoyle Halloween issue, but it's Beavis somebody Head. Uh, they're passing through Amish country. I think this came out around the same time as the movie Kingpin, but they're in Intercourse, Pennsylvania. 23 from the Marvel absurd classic run. This is issue 25, uh, also from 1996, towards the end of the run. It's a surgeon cover I thought was, kind of reminded me of. I love what they were doing with the borders at this time. Oh, it's actually a, a New Year cover, even though it's dated for March. <laughs> I guess they're a little slow. And this one right here. I actually bought this one off of Amazon, which I hate to do, but it's not too bad. And it's really cool. Beavis and Butthead playing around with an Iron Maiden. If you really look at Butthead, you can see where the little prick got poked. <laughs> <laughs> all over, all over. <laughs> Beavis wants his turn. Here's some kind of uh, okay, Halloween festive Ren and Stimpy. Well, full blown Ichabod Crane, Headless Horseman, <laughs> minus Ichabod. Your head here. It's a cool cover. This is issue 40. Heads up. It's the Ren and Stimpy show. I loved how they still called it a show, even though it was a comic book. I really like that. Here's issue 38. This was also put out by Marvel. Absurd. And this, this image right here of crocodile in the sewer for some reason reminded me of the Haunted Mansion Disneyland ride with right over the crocodile pit. Although I guess it's set in New Orleans so it might be a alligator. This is an alien abduction cover which yeah it still reminds me of Halloween. Issue 37. Nice cover. Yeah, they, they put that absurd Marvel, just to let you know it's a gross out book. Marvel gross out comics. <laughs> this is cool. Reminds me of the classic Kirby, Stan Lee monster books. Hokey Halloween horror. Goo Gum Lives. <laughs> goo gum goo <laughs> I like the uh, inking on goo this might be more of like a cosplay cover I don't know unofficial spidey appearance. I don't know if it's canon.
it's just a comic, but yeah. <laughs> Powdered toast, man. All right, this is just, uh, this is from a, uh, some pawn shop pickups. I've been, um, I found a little pawn shop on eBay that sells comics, almost like a grab bag. And these were thrown in. This book, Wildstar, I was interested in as a kid, but I only got the first issue because Image would really pump out their first issues, and it was hard to find subsequent comics from that title. This happened to me with, um, uh, what was it, Johnson and Strawman's Tribe. It happened with... Uh, Mark Tex and Heischler's Union. I had a little bit better luck with Trencher by Keith Giffen. And then there was other stuff that, you know, you could find like Death Blow. But they really pushed out their issue ones. And this one's cool because this was during the time of the, the symbiote, you know, after Venom. There was a couple of characters that had living protective suits or organic to their tissue uh, and they'd speak in the third person because they were one with the suit but they were still two entities combined and that's what Wildstar was uh, Jerry Ordway and Gordon's uh, Mar well this is an image book but so this is the gold one I didn't even know about this when I bought them they didn't mention that one of them was gold but uh yeah! Kind of cool. I never had it. I never knew about it. Even the eyes are gold. The whole thing's embossed. The blood feels kind of cool. Very, very Halloween. If you just look at it, it could be a mask, right? And then the, this is the one I had. I, I remember reading and wanting to get issue two, but like I said, um, <laughs> there are, you know, Image had already kind of moved on to what was going to be their next big number one, you know? So, um, can't even really find the following issues. So this is why I actually bought from the pawn shop again. This is part of the original Madman. I think these were put out by Tundra Comics, but I took a little, I took a coin flip on whether or not this would be a good issue. And it's been, I think it's been read. But it's a nice square bound book. This is issue one. It's a first print. It's not the first appearance of Mad Men, but I think it's the first Mad Men in his own title. And this is a mini book. I don't know what it came with. Hero Magazine it was like the tough stuff comic guide. I know it came with something like that. It was an included little bonus book. This is Madman Adventures. This came out after the, the initial Madman book. This was like uh, series two. But yeah, these are all included in it. I, th I think I got them for 15. The only thing was they wanted nine for shipping, but the shipping they did a great job with, you know? Uh, so. This is issue one of the second series. Let's take a quick look. I am in, in no way um, adverse to flipping through these. Oh yeah, this is the first time he was in full color too. Look at that. I really, really like the way you know, call me crazy. I love it when a cartoonist has refined their style, but there's something special about them when they're in their experimental phase where they haven't quite cemented the way they're going to draw and ink for the rest of their lives. And this is kind of what this is right here. Um, oh, there's Joe. Jump in Jehoshaphat's what I wouldn't do for Joe. That is quality, quality redhead. 
So anyway, issue two. Yeah, if you can find these for cheap, I don't think people try to get a lot for them, but I didn't need these in super high grade. Issue three. I like this guy right here. This guy looks like a Quentin Tarantino character. Well, you wash me, wash them. I watched you get them wet. I was washing them. This shit's hard to get off. Maybe if you had lava, I could have done a better job. That skinny tie. It's cool, man. <clears throat> All right. Oh, so this was inspired by Comet Crypt of Castle Hills. Shout out to Mike for sharing this. I didn't know about this book. I shared uh, my my big Marvel book of Frank Miller on Spider-Man. Um, and it didn't include this, so I was kind of like scratching my head. You know, because a lot of times when they put out new, like, McFarlane covers for Marvel, it's pre-existing interiors. But I had, I had no record of this image. And then I all it could be is that it's new. And... I think it actually is a new image. It's, hey, what's up? Happy Halloween. Um, Sinclair, I know that's his contemporary colorist because he doesn't work with Lynn Varley anymore. But this just shut my mouth. And I don't, the, the trade dress and the, the bricks, I, oh, it's perfect. It is I mean, Spidey Toes, yeah, it's my favorite Frank Miller image in a long time. It's it's terrific. I, I This one was completely unbeknownst to me. And I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know what volume Spider-Man this is, but man, that is... All right, so shout out to Lee of Big Elbow. Um, his, his channel is the one where I learn a, a lot about the good reads, the solid eighties black and white stuff, as well as a lot of the, um, just the, the good Marvel storylines. And, uh, this is something that he gave me. This is a air cell book, gun fury. Mm. I read it. It was right up my alley. See what I like about this book is it reminds me of the the well-meaning vigilantes that just go too far. Think, Frank Castle knows that he's effed in the head and he just does it anyway. He doesn't care. But these guys like to give you movie examples like um, Rain Wilson Super or something I saw Tom Smith recommended. Defendor with Woody Harrelson. Just these guys that are a little wrecked, but they're efficient <laughs> and they're incredibly brutal. And they're they're kind of like Rorschach, you know, they they have these agendas and these kind of codes. And uh, I got this one from Lee. I read it. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, he just want he wanted my opinion. He wanted to know if I'd ever seen inks like this. And the one the first thing I noticed was just how like like kind of fluffy this art style looks. But I thought, man, this is cool. I, I like these kind of comics. Should, Show me a comic by a guy, you know, that just has a dream. This just looked cool to me. And it gave me an idea of, of some of the relentlessness while immersed in brutal violence. <laughs> so I thought I thought this was great. I really like the art. I like cartoony art, I'm not gonna lie. I like cartoony video games. I like cartoony comics. I like cartoony cartoons. All right. So, yeah, that this one was from Lee. And he just, he said, hey, what do you think of this? Have you ever seen anyone 
ink like Dave Cooper? And probably not. So here's Gun Fury 2. This one, I don't know, it's cut a little funny. It's like, if you look, it's, it's a little shorter than the other issues. Like, that's lined, that's lined up evenly. So I looked at it, and it doesn't look trimmed. I mean, trimming a $1.95 comic seems a little extreme, but that's a small press. Maybe they just cut them differently that time. Well, anyway, just kind of reminds me of, like, this, this muscle-bound guy that the villain sends after the hero, and he's just... He's so whacked out on whatever they, they put him on. Uh, it's kind of the vibe I get. Again, there's the kid. <laughs> With the machine gun. That's issue four. Issue five. I love that. That, that reminds me of 70s cartoons. The eyes like that. issue six I love that light pole that's great man it's issue seven how good does that fast food look let's flip through this one real quick I forget which one Lee says he doesn't have oh this is a nice thick book too yeah, I mean, like a, a comedic version of this would be like, like the Tick, <laughs> um, a serious version of this would be la, like Garth Ennis's DC character. What's his name? Uh, Midnight. Not exactly what I would call an outlaw comic, but strange. These are from Canada. I just didn't see this kind of watercolor work in the, the mainstream. You, you had guys like Sienkiewicz that really pushed the envelope. But this stuff right here is... Just, I like it. I appreciate Lee for uh, getting me into it. Here's issue eight, year one, the origin of Gun Fury. Oh, cool. So he's just barely starting on this one. I like that. Boom. Big boot. Scumbag here. Issue nine. That's cool. issue 10 last issue anyway awesome there so here's a trade I love getting trades from my comic shop Lone Star Comics this one was the cheapest one online and they said it would be in a fine and I don't mind this is a nice copy uh, what print is this? This is a Madman. Second printing of the trait. And this is the this is the story I talk about all the time. Well, I brought it up once. I'm exaggerating. I mentioned it in, in passing. But this this is the Madman story. I remember reading a lot in the waiting room at like you know, go with my dad. He'd have an appointment at Kaiser and I'd bring this and I'd read it. It was lovely Joe. And, and this story, I just got a kick out of it. And it's it's a whole other world. I think it's still my favorite thing by uh, Mike Allred. 
it just, I don't know, if you could find this for five bucks, it, you could just immerse yourself in this world for about an hour and a half, two hours. Alright, so I finally got my facsimile of Master of Dreams. Gonna turn out to paddling. Looking out the window, that's a paddling. Staring at my sandals. That's a paddling. Oh, I have the DC Essentials. And now I have this facsimile. And I asked Davis, hey man, can you show me a can you show me a picture of the back cover? And he sent me a picture and it was this. I said, yep, that's a facsimile. I was able to resist the urge to throw an ad for anything but the classic. True facsimile. Sam Keith. All of the, the ads are in there. They just, you know, they have to date them really, really carefully because, you know, you too. Uh, all the music stuff they have to be really careful of. This was just a real like, Rolling Stone magazine kind of comic, so they'd put a lot of music ads in there. That sort of stuff. Look at look what this letterer had to, had to do for Morbius to speak. It's it's beyond reason, you know, to think that we could even hear the master of dreams spoken voice. It even kind of has that old comic smell. <laughs> no, I don't know about that, but yeah, this is a good deal. All right, so I, I already had this book, but I needed an upgrade. I bought a truck, second to last issue on Amazon, and it came to me. <laughs> the guy mailed it just the comic in a manila envelope, nothing else, and I needed a better copy. So I got this one for like $2.50, second to last issue. Um, oh yeah, it's a direct sale, but yeah, I just, I needed a nicer copy. And this is a cool cover. It looks, well, Timothy Truman's writing, it almost has like that Mike Grell look to it though. And, um, yeah, I didn't know about these either. Um, but I also have a, a little vignette of some... Archie horror stuff. Yeah, so flipping through this Weirder Mysteries Archie horror, not to be confused with the Weird Mysteries Archie cartoon, I saw that they're doing some audiobooks now, including Jughead the Hunger, done in uh, Werewolf in Riverdale, as well as the Vampironica stuff done in this interview with the Vixen story. And right there on Audible, they're available to buy now. Seems like the Archie horror books are doing a lot this autumn. And although I don't currently subscribe to Audible, these these books are available to just buy outright, which is kind of cool. Uh, they are, I believe, available in paperback form as well. We could try out a little sample of werewolf in Riverdale it's uh, right here CR part one in sheep's clothing one as far as Dilton Doily was concerned if he was going to die tonight then a graveyard was as good a place to do it as any other in four segments, and that one was about six and a half hours. Here's an interview with the Vixen. In a game that's only going to lead to kissing and crying and somebody breaking up on the front lawn after midnight. But isn't that the fun of it? It is for me anyway. Cheryl's wearing cutoffs, the ones that Mommy Dearest always says are trashy. With that rictus smile she's so practiced, at giving her dog 
So yeah, they announced it as Archie Horrors Month of Mayhem. There's also some really good deals going on the Archie Comics website for the Archie Horror stuff. Pretty much all the one-shots are available. I think some of them are available for pre-order. And they're really competitive with Amazon as far as the trades on the pre-existing Archie Horror stuff. The Jughead the Hunger books have all been collected in different volumes. They have an Archie Horror bundle. The Vampironica, including the New Blood, which I just ordered. Blossoms 666. And some cool apparel. The first Chilling Adventures, the sorcery book. And another one coming out called Happy Horror Days. I don't know if that's going to be more kitty based or true horror. So here is Salem. One and done. Cool, man. Ah, uh, look. Um, I forget what they call these. Um, what, what is the name for these? I should know. Well, anyway, let's take a quick flip through. Colin Bunn, Dan Schroening on pencils, inks by Ben Galvin. This looks pretty cool, man. Archie Horror is just such a haven for old spooky comic stories. That is a clean kill. I don't want to spoil too much more. Yeah, get a copy if you can. I just, I'm enthralled by these Archie Horror books. There's the Francovia cover. You know the deal. And if you don't know, now you know. Check out the comic crypt. Uh, Jinx Grim Fairy Tales is another book that came out. Another. Man. I don't care what they say. It's Frank of you till the day I die. <laughs> Look at these cute little frogs. Jinx. Grim Fairy Tales. And another. So, well, let me do kind of a little segue. I did not know about this. And if this is old news, I didn't know. Getting sleepy. You will send only cool people AOKs. We as a community will bring back comic book contests once a week. We will draw pictures of busty comic book girls and send them to our hombres out of the kindness of our hearts. And Psylocke. Whoa, are you back? Okay, just one more thing for the road. So yeah, I got one of these, um, Dirt Cheap, from Archio's, Archie Comics. I don't think I had the New Blood Vampironica stuff. And man, I love Ronnie. I love Ronnie. Wow, look at that. She's got legs. Chapter four, cover art, Audrey Mock. Really cool. Yeah. Laura Braga, 
Damn. Look at those thighs. Fantastic. Oh. It's like, um, it's Carrie. Uh, this is a nice little cover gallery, don't you guys think? For I don't think this one was five bucks. I think series one is five bucks, though. You can get it for a fiver. Uh, why does she have a samurai sword? Some guy, uh, some girl named Megan Hutchinson has a samurai sword thing. I don't know if, if she ever used a samurai sword. Wow. That looks like Ben Oliver, but it's... <laughs> Craig Smallwood. <laughs> oh, man. Adam Gorham. That's okay. <laughs> Smallwood. <laughs> hey, this guy kills it, though. <laughs> he makes up... He makes up for another walks of life. Vic Mahatra. That's pretty nice. I like the way he stacks his name too. Mahatra. Is there what's the better way to say that? Mahatra. Mm, Mahatra. No. Lisa Sterl sketch covers. Oh yeah. Issue two pop soda fountain. And if you made it that far. Oh man. This is is this not Smallville but Riverdale. Yeah, okay. It was a teenage wedding, and the old folks wished them well. Riverdale, you can get. Oh, not so much, man. Not so much. Give me, give me that stuff right there. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching. I have a baked potato in the oven. You guys, have a great Halloween. Um, enjoy your families. All right, guys. Um, take it easy. And, yeah, check out this recipe on how you could make some delicious sauerkraut and spare ribs. Enjoy, and c'est la vie, and adios, and enjoy. Hey, I'm going to show you one of my favorite recipes for this time of the year. It's good around Halloween time. It's a good, fast, quick meal, and it's just some sauerkraut with spare ribs. And just this last time, this last batch, I experimented with adding some uh, turkey kielbasa. First, you're probably just going to want to start with some chicken broth. Uh, I would put about six cups of water because we're going to have to submerge uh, some baby back ribs so they can someone explain baby back ribs it's here to me when i'm eating ribs do i really want to be thinking about a baby's back <laughs> pulling off the bone but yeah just some chicken broth is a good way to start uh bouillon or if you're fancy you can get the kind that's um like a paste Can't be bad. so i got these ribs cut the long way they're already frozen but it's just um some uh, pork shoulder blade sliced and I got them for uh, what two forty nine a pound. Yeah, so I got a nice uh, four pound rack, and uh, that's enough for a real big batch. Or you could probably use two pounds, use half as much. But yeah, I use them cut the long way horizontally, just because it helps with the cooking a little quicker. So yeah, this smoked turkey. I think I got these for two fifty a bundle horseshoe shaped at Target and I put this in last uh, basically once everything's so typically started. I would buy the Vlasic sauerkraut in a jar but um, I got these at Food for Less for $1.50 a can it's real cheap and you don't have to worry about glass leaving the store 
but you can't put a price on that. Got my Jolly Green and Popeye Greens. So here's the leftover batch, which is never the most appealing thing to show. But I'll just tell you, what you would do is you would get about four cups of water and start cooking those ribs, adding water periodically as uh, it evaporates. Uh, and then once the ribs are basically falling off the bone, you let the water cook down a little more. And then you add your cans of sauerkraut. I'd say about four for two pounds of ribs. Cook that. And once basically it's got a nice form, the water is basically eh, below the surface of the kraut. You could turn that off and then you could add the sausage. And uh, this is the leftover form. So let me heat this up so you can see what it looks like. And it's when it's nice. Anyhow, this is how it looks when it's, it's good to go. Get your nice uh, shredded pork in there and delicious kielbasa sausage. And I rinse the sauerkraut out a little bit just so the vinegar taste isn't too overpowering. But yeah, it's, it's a real classic. I love it. Serves 12 or leftovers for a week for one or two people. It's awesome. You could add a little uh, brown mustard for the sausage. And you can either kind of pick out the bones and the cartilage off the ribs as you go, or just leave it up to the individual. It's the best. Pork shreds up real nice so you can get a little bit in every bite. boss, I get some mustard. This is a story from Raleigh Jefferson's Awesome Friendly Spooky Stories by Jeff Kinney. It's kind of cool. This kid really has a funny perspective on things and his stories are different. And this one's called The Stain. One Saturday afternoon, Robbie's parents asked him if he'd like to go to the mall. Robbie was very excited because going to the mall was a special treat. And on the car ride, Robbie thought of all the fun he'd have once he got there. But Robbie's parents weren't at the mall for fun. They were there to shop, and they visited the types of stores only grown-ups like. Robbie's parents could see that their son wasn't having very much fun, so Robbie's dad gave him five bucks and told him he could buy himself an ice cream. And his dad told Robbie that there was enough money for two cones, so Robbie should get him one too. Robbie felt very proud that his parents trusted him, and he told them that he'd be right back. For Robbie, this was a very big deal. Even though the ice cream shop was just a few doors down, this was the first time he'd been apart from his parents in such a crowded place. Robbie walked out of the store into the concourse, which was packed with strangers. He clutched the money his dad gave him very tightly because he didn't want to drop it. Then Robbie spotted his favorite ride. It was a rocket ship that went back and forth. But Robbie reminded himself that he was too old for kiddie rides now, and he clutched the $5 even tighter to make sure he didn't spend it. Robbie made it to the ice cream shop and was proud of himself for getting that far on his own. But when he got to the front counter, he didn't know what to do because there were a lot of flavors and it was so hard to choose. Chocolate, rainbow sherbet, Mint chocolate chip, lemon, vanilla, strawberry, coffee, birthday cake, pistachio, cookie dough, rocky road. Robbie's two favorite ice cream flavors were rocky road and strawberry. So Robbie got rocky road for himself and strawberry for his dad because he knew his dad would probably share with him. On his way back to the store where his parents were shopping, Robbie saw that rocket ship again. Robbie had just enough money left over for one ride, but he wanted to show his parents he could be responsible and bring back their change. So he closed his eyes when he walked by the ride. But that was a bad idea because he tripped and his Rocky Road ice cream ended up on the ground. Robbie was so upset he almost cried. He tried to put his ice cream cone back together again, but it was hopeless. After Robbie cleaned up his mess, he went to the store where his parents were shopping, 
His dad's strawberry ice cream was starting to melt, but Robbie was still hoping his dad would share some with him. Then Robbie had an idea, and it wasn't the kind of idea Robbie usually had. He decided to pretend that the strawberry ice cream cone was his, and the one that he dropped was his dad's. And this was a really big deal, because Robbie had never told a fib in his whole life. Robbie was so nervous lying to his parents that he almost cried again, and then he felt terrible when his parents actually believed him. But Robbie's dad said it was okay, because he wasn't hungry anyway. And that made Robbie feel even worse, because he knew his dad was just being nice. In fact, he felt so bad, he could barely enjoy his strawberry ice cream on the ride home. When Robbie got back to his room, his stomach didn't feel that good, and he couldn't tell if it was because of the ice cream or the fib he'd told his parents. Then, Robbie noticed a small pink spot on his white t-shirt, and he realized he must have gotten some strawberry ice cream on it. Robbie knew his parents wouldn't be happy with him for getting ice cream on his crisp white shirt, so he went into the bathroom to try to scrub it clean before they found out, but the spot was growing bigger and bigger by the second. Robbie took off his shirt and put it in the sink where he ran it under soapy water. But after he was done scrubbing his shirt, the stain was still growing, and it was bigger than ever. By now, Robbie was starting to freak out. Robbie's mom came upstairs to give him a warm glass of milk before bedtime, but Robbie kept himself locked in his room until she was gone. Crawl, crawl. As soon as the coast was clear, Robbie ran to the laundry room to put his shirt in the washing machine and he turned the dial to the strongest setting to make sure he got rid of the stain. Just then, Robbie's dad came into the room with a load of laundry, and Robbie was so startled that he almost jumped out of his skin. Robbie's dad asked him what he was doing, and Robbie said he was washing some of his clothes. So Robbie's dad said he was proud of his son for becoming such a responsible young man. That night, Robbie had terrible dreams, and most of them involved strawberries. When Robbie woke up, his sheets were soaked with sweat. Robbie got out of bed and went to the laundry room to see if the stain was still on his shirt. But Robbie got a terrible surprise. His dad had put his nice dress shirts in the washing machine with Robbie's shirt, and now all the clothes were stained pink. Robbie decided the only thing he could do was run away. But luckily his mom caught him before he got too far. It was time for Robbie to tell his parents the truth. He confessed that the ice cream he dropped at the mall was his, and not his dad's. Then he said he was sorry for lying about it. Well, Robbie's parents loved their son very much, and they told him that they were proud of him for telling the truth. They said that everyone makes mistakes, but the important thing is that you learn from them. And just to show how great Robbie's parents were, they took him back to the mall so they could all get ice cream together. Robbie bought three ice cream cones, all Rocky Road. And this time he was extra careful not to drop any. But Robbie forgot his dad was allergic to almonds and his father's lips swelled up like balloons. Robbie's dad had to go to the emergency room to get a shot, which made it hard for Robbie to enjoy his ice cream. When Robbie got home, he noticed a small chocolate stain on his crisp white shirt, and the whole thing started up again.